Samha Sambuddhasa Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanggang Namasami Sawakato Bhagavata Dhammo Sanditiko Akaliko Ehi Pasiko Upanayiko Pachatam Veditabo Vinyuhiti The Dhamma is well expounded by the Blessed One, apparent here and now, timeless, encouraging investigation, leading inwards to be experienced individually by the wise. Good morning again, everyone. Um, yeah, Ajahn uh, Nisibo um, is attending um, the memorial service for Tuere Sala. Uh, her son, Darius, uh, passed away recently, and uh, the memorial service is this morning, so that's why I'm zooming in. And it somewhat dovetails with uh, something which uh, try to recollect and, and understand, get our minds around in, in practice in general, which is what is the, the purpose or the role, uh, the benefit of, of ritual uh, in our life and in a, a Buddhist life and a Buddhist practice when we come together um, to share space. What is, um, what is ritual and how can I relate to it in a way which is not aversive or uh, judgmental and one um, useful framework um, that I've found for relating to um, uh, ritual are what are called in Pali the punya kirya vatu, uh, which translates most literally as the basis for merit. So vatu, the basis, punya is merit, uh, but you can also translate it as the richness. So that's uh, punya and ritual or vatu, kiriya vatu, uh, the rituals for richness. And uh, this is a, a set of uh, 10 teachings which are given, which really provide a, a beautiful framework for life. Um, they prov provide a really uh, useful framework for understanding ritual and they also provide a neat context for the present moment, because really that's all of what the Buddhist teachings are about, are the, uh, is this present moment right here and now, that chant that I did, that the Dhamma is uh, well expounded, apparent here and now, timeless, leading inwards. So that's always what we're, we're aiming towards uh, with the ritualized parts of our life and uh, really every part of our life. And ritual doesn't have to be a a rote and dead and totally unconscious uh, habitual thing which our parents or churches that we grew up with uh, foisted, just thrust upon us. But it can really be something beautiful which we bring to our life. It can be a, a richness as that chant went after the requesting the, the precepts that Silena Boga Sampada, that is, uh, rich wealth is accomplished through keeping precepts or through these different bases of merit. Um, even the word merit is sometimes difficult for people who didn't grow up in a, a Buddhist country, or if you did, it might be totally uh, corrupted as well. So you have to come up with a, a new relationship with this idea of punya, or generally translated as merit. Um, there was an instance where uh, some monks came to the Buddha and we're saying merit, merit. They talk about merit, but what is that? Is it just something which lay people are supposed to do and is a lower practice? And the Buddha said, uh, don't say that. Merit or punya is just another name for happiness. So these are rituals for happiness, ways to open up to happiness uh, in the course of our day and in each and every present moment. So I'll just uh, go through these 10 basis of merit, these 10 rituals for um, richness, and uh, consider how each of us might be able to 
uh, adopt them in our daily lives. For, so the first is uh, giving or dana, the rituals of dana in our life, um, how we give. So in a, a Buddhist country, this is really easy. You have um, basically times of generosity that are built into someone's uh, daily life. So in a, a forest monastery, or if you're living um, anywhere near a temple, which if you're in Thailand, you are, because there are 30,000 temples, monasteries in, in Thailand. Um, if the monks go alms, then that's a amazing opportunity to practice giving first thing in the morning, a very tangible way uh, for someone to make offerings. And uh, as for myself, being the beneficiary of that, seeing the, the beauty of generosity every single day of my monk's life, it's profound and life-changing to know that every cell of my body, if the cells in one's body shift every seven years, then I've been a monk for 14 years now, 13, 14 years, uh, then I've had two full rotations of bodily cells which have just been fully nourished by the gifts of other people. And that's uh, really profound to, to think about. Um, but it's also beautiful to see other people doing if it's not done in a, um, a rote way or kind of a, a half-hearted way. Even if it is half-hearted, it's still beautiful and it still um, uh, can, be, can be useful. But the more intentionality we can give to our giving, um, the better. And it certainly doesn't have to be towards monks. You can see the, although that's a great ritualized form that exists in Buddhist countries to uh, basically force, it's a forcing function for um, daily giving. Um, you can do it even outside of certainly uh, monastic context. Obviously, that's the main form that it takes um, is that, yeah, the gifts that you give to your family the dinner that you prepare for your spouse or the lunch you prepare for your kids. And what ritual does is just uh, let you stop, you know, and, and it, it uh, brings the habits of one's days. It brings oomph to one's daily habits. And that oomph comes with intentionality and it comes with, um, comes with care and the more intentionality and care that we can bring to our daily habits, uh, the better, especially uh, the wholesome ones, which is what we're talking about here. So certainly uh, dana or generosity is, uh, is beautiful in finding ways to ritualize it, ritualizing your life, um, finding ways to bring specific acts of generosity into your life, whether that's, um, yeah, every having a calendar, date on your Google calendar or whatever, telling you, okay, at the end of the month, you have to uh, give away a certain amount of your your salary or your earnings, something like that, just ways to ritualize and not just pressing the, not just automating it necessarily, but actually taking the time to press the button and yeah, generate a sincere wish. May benefits, uh, may beings benefit from, from this gift. So yeah, the beauty of generosity. The second uh, punya kiriyavatu, or this uh, ritual of richness, is sila, or principles. So sila is more often translated as morality, or virtue, or even as precepts. And it can be a beautiful way of ritualizing our life. So just as we did this morning, uh, Juanita requested the precepts, and then I, as a, a monk, wearing these robes, uh, a symbol of um, keeping, uh, keeping rules, a, a symbol of hopefully, um, yeah, a uh, symbol of rules in action with, with compassion and care, and then taking the precepts in that way. But you don't have to do it like that. I mean, um, myself, Rajan Nisibo, will, quote, give the precepts, um, I believe it's the first Saturday of the month, um, but I believe every uh, two weeks on the Discord server, the Clear Mountain Discord server, we also give the, the precepts or we'll recite the precepts. And you don't have to wait for a monk. You can just do this however often you want. In the Sri Lankan tradition, if you look at the Bhavana Society, this is a, a monastery in 
uh, West Virginia, the abbot is Bhante Gunaratana. And in their chanting book, they have this as a daily chant, basically taking on and reciting your precepts uh, every day. And that's beautiful, just recollecting that I'm someone who doesn't kill. I, I aspire, I take on this training to not steal, commit sexual misconduct, to lie. And um, it's easy enough that if you're just naturally naturally of a habit not to kill or uh, naturally truthful, then it might just seem very easy for you. But um, if you recite it, it um, yeah, you can see the the lightness of heart that it that it can bring when you really do it intentionally. And even if that's somewhat formulaic, like like we do, we're all reciting. One person recites, and then people recite after them, or you're reciting from a book. Um, but that doesn't have to be inherently um, deadening. It doesn't have to be uninspiring and rote just because it's been said by lots and lots of people for lots and lots of years. Um, so yeah, allowing that ritual that is um, a repeated and um, intentional repetition of certain actions can have can have purpose and um, can bring purpose and intentionality one's life one's life and just as you can find ways to bring um, bring to mind what principles what uh, rules you're you're living by into your daily life you can bring this into your present moment experience especially if you're meditating in that way that I was suggesting during the guided meditation this knowing the mind in and of itself ardent alert and mindful putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world, this global awareness. Um, you can just see what aspect, what shade, what um, investigate how precepts or this prin principled naturedness, how is that uh, a part of, of the heart, of the mind, of this knowing nature? Um, explore that relationship. You can do that in the present moment with generosity, with dana, that first basis as well by in the present moment, as I look at the mind, this spacious knowing, how can I give up? And you can use that as a remedy for the mind that wants to latch on to thoughts or emotions. Just, okay, just as I have been practicing giving up or giving away, giving in, I can similarly uh, give up this, this thought and just trust in this broader uh, awareness, this spacious knowing. The third uh, ritual of richness, the Punya Kiryavatu, is bhavana, or meditation. Uh, the word literally means cultivation, and is cultivation of any wholesome mind state. And yeah, we do what we call formal meditation. So obviously, um, or perhaps not so obviously, uh, in a, a Buddhist conception of things, we would be bhavana-ing all the time. Basically, all of one's life should be um, cultivating some uh, wholesome dharma, some wholesome uh, virtue, or letting go of some unwholesome dharma, some unwholesome uh, habit pattern, and just doing that all the time, even if that just means resting in peace. Um, and it can help to have formal periods of your day, whether it's um, half an hour or an hour or 15 minutes or even five minutes scattering these very uh, intentional periods of formal meditation throughout your day can strengthen can and can uh, almost empower your capacity to bhavana throughout the rest of the day to come back to this knowing and when you are in this spacious mind mind space um, yeah constantly kind of keeping a, a watch keeping a, an alert eye on what is the mind doing? Is there brightness here? Or am I just wandering off? That's the, the cultivation in the present moment. The fourth uh, ritual for richness or punya kiriyavatu is humility. <laughs> so um, it's good to note um, as we go on that all of these that when we talk about these different virtues or these uh, different rituals um, as they're expressed whether in person in a group setting at saint mark's or in a future clear mountain monastery when people are bowing together or taking precepts they are not compulsory they are totally optional and um, 
yeah, you can follow along these rituals if you want, um, or you can just sit there and see how that feels, or um, yeah, and maybe you, yeah, maybe they, it's not the time yet for you to, um, yeah, follow along with the rituals as you are understanding them and seeing them. Uh, but just being open, perhaps, that they're not um, meaningless for other people. And But being okay. If they're not meaningful for you, then no problem. But this fourth one of humility, uh, how that's ritualized, there are many ways it's um, brought and lived in, um, in Buddhist monasteries and Buddhist circles. One is just bowing. <laughs> There's lots of bowing in monasteries. Um, but again, that's something which many people are not yet uh, down with. It's something which we didn't grow up with in America, and uh, it seems like giving somebody or something more agency over me than I'm comfortable giving. Um, the Pali word, apachayana, the root is chai, which means, or chi, which means to heap up. So apa is basically moving away from that, so not heaping up. And what are we not heaping up? In our gestures or our language or our rituals of humility, we're not heaping up the ego. Basically, uh, doing these gestures and can I bring, always bring 100% participation and mindfulness to every moment of every bow? Probably not, but it's it's a good thing to, to aim towards and um, it can be just a lovely gesture and uh, figuring out some kind of relationship with the, the way that you, the bow or the way that you do this kind of um, yeah, gesture of humility, uh, it can become quite powerful. So if you're ready and interested in inserting bowing into your life, there are many ways to do that. Um, first thing in the morning, that's what uh, most or possibly all monks in our tradition do. First thing we wake up, basically get up and might still be groggy, but it's easy enough to hands to the head, and then just bow three times. Uh, all of our, our huts, living spaces, have shrines like this, and um, just bowing to, what are we bowing to? Are we bowing to some guru or um, some guy who died a long time ago? Um, it doesn't have to be like that. Just basically bowing to something uh, greater than our ego, something bigger than us, a spaciousness that's not just... Um, limited to our, um, yeah, this tiny world inside of our skulls. So experiment, see if you're up for that and see how that might lead to um, some feeling of, of ease or um, yeah, even, even beauty, kind of lowering yourself to something. Uh, the fifth uh, ritual for richness or punya kiriyavatu is service or veya vacha. So at the Clear Mountain events, People have the opportunity for this. You can come early to help set up the space or you can stay after to help uh, break things down and put things away. Um, it's a great thing to do and certainly builds community and there are ways to do that in probably most organizations, finding ways to, to give and just exploring if that might be a, an aspect of your, your life or your practice that you want to uh, find ways to tap into. I believe John Bull, who is probably over there by the um, AV system, he's the, I believe he's still the um, volunteer coordinator. So people can talk with him. There's lots of opportunities to volunteer for Clear Mountain events, either in person or uh, elsewhere. But the Buddha once was asked by a Brahmin, where should I give? And the Buddha's answer was just awesome. He said, uh, give wherever you feel inspired, which is great. Uh, elsewhere, he said that even just taking the leftover rice grains in your bowl and pouring them into the sink or into a pond, thinking, may the benefits here benefit, even that is uh, meritorious, even that is punya, even that is good. So all the more to, to give to a human. So basically any service you do in any cause, if it's something you feel good about, yeah, see how that affects the heart and see how uh, in the present moment, giving yourself to your meditation object um, affects your life, affects your practice, affects your life. The sixth 
uh, ritual is sharing merit. So this is called patidana in Pali. And um, this is a, a practice which um, is formalized, ritualized in, in monasteries. So if anyone's ever gone down and offered food to Ajahn Nisibo, uh, he may have done uh, this chant, which is Yata variwaha pura paripurinte sagarang eva meva ito dinam petanang upa kapate ichitam patitang tum hang kipa meva samijatu sabe purantu sankapa chando panaraso yata manijo tiraso yata which means just as rivers full of water entirely fill up the sea so will what's here been given bring blessings to departed spirits. So this is a, the way it's traditionally understood um, in Buddhist countries is that there's almost this um, yeah, capacity um, when one makes offerings for that goodness to be transferred to beings in other realms. So that's a certain mindset, which most Americans are certainly unfamiliar with, and sounds a little bit crazy. How does that work? I mean, there's no Wi-Fi, presumably, in the ghost realms or wherever. Um, how do these beings get um, the merit that I'm sending? So, yeah, you don't have to believe that. Um, but just as rivers full of water entirely fill up the sea, so will what's here been given bring blessings to departed spirits. Just think about that. Um, when you do something good, think, May other beings benefit from that, whether you want to bring it to the level of beings in other realms, which may or may not exist. Um, yeah, bring it to the people in your life. May, through this act of, of sharing, may this benefit and make me more generous in other areas of my life where I'm not yet so generous. May my putting monks food in a monk's bowl, uh, may that lead to me being more generous in with my family. Um, may this act of giving to my family, let me be more generous with giving to my co-workers and my friends. So dedicating merit, sharing merit in that certain way. This next one is really cool too. This one is patanumodana or rejoicing. So um, this literally means rejoicing in the goodness of others. Ajahn Jayasaro calls this uh, the lazy man's way of making merit. Because basically you don't have to do anything. You just have to rejoice or delight in something somebody else does. So even if you're not the one who's helping clean up the St. Mark's, which hopefully you will, um, but even if you're not, you can say, actually, I think it's cool and I appreciate that that other person is doing that. And when you see uh, the, um, the lightness and the brightness, the light that, um, when you can see that in others, then it inclines one's own mind in the same way. And just that right there is a, a way of delighting, um, a way of rejoicing. Um, and ways to ritualize this are, um, yeah, just reflecting, actively reflecting. When you, and this is something which I need to stop myself and, and actually remember. So when I see someone doing something nice and a smile comes to my face, actually being able to na name that as a specific Buddhist virtue for me being a Buddhist, wanting to be a better Buddhist, you know, it, it's it's helpful for that. Um, yeah, this is this is rejoicing. This is patanumodana, just delighting in that person's goodness. Um, but it doesn't have to be at all a Buddhist thing or at all a um, a religious thing. Just yeah, mudita, uh, delighting in other people's goodness. That's a um, yeah, it's a, a basis for merit. The next ritual for rich. Riches, richness is listening to Dhamma, Dhamma Savana. So after we sat meditation, uh, Juanita did the invitation to the Dhamma talk, and that's a ritual. She says one thing, it's basically uh, from the suttas where this Brahma god comes down and requests the Buddha to do the teachings. Um, that's what she's, she's saying, and that's whoever does the Dhamma talk is reciting uh, the Dhamma talk invitation. Um, just inviting one, uh, the Dhamma speaker, to share the Dhamma. Um, and 
doing that, figuring out ways to bring the ritual of listening to Dhamma into your life, whether that's having a specific time of day where you sit down and read read a Dhamma book or uh, listen to Dhamma MP3s. And I mean, you're going to find tons of Dhamma materials online. I mean, uh, you know, you know. Um, so there's lots of opportunities. Um, or doing it something live like this or on our Wednesday night uh, Clear Mountain Zoom sessions. Um, that then bleeds into the ninth um, ritualization of merit, which is talking Dhamma. So it needn't just be uh, yeah, finding ways to listen to Dhamma. It can be interactive, um, finding, you know, creating these forcing functions for actually not just taking in the Dhamma, but actually speaking Dhamma and talking to your, to your friends, especially, um, <laughs> of course, those people who you enjoy conversation with, um, those people who, who maybe have certain levels of uh, morality that you don't do, that you don't have, people who are stronger in their uh, skillful speech than you are, people who are better at giving, um, just hanging around such people and, and talking about them and getting like these pro tips on, yeah, how do I, how do I become a, a better giver? How do I uh, yeah, become more better how, uh, or more, more humble? How do I, um, yeah, what's the best way to bow? You know, these kind of things. Um, and in the present moment, uh, hopefully in a, a, page, a space of uh, broad and open awareness, um, yeah, you don't have to just uh, sit there and just keep coming back to openness. You can uh, allow, you can you know, drop words of, of Dhamma into that, into that space and just let those words permeate the, the space like uh, dye in water. And the tenth basis of merit is dit uju, so straightening out one's views. And this is, um, it resists uh, ritualization to some extent. I mean, you can say um, that reading the suttas or reading some wisdom text that you find um, yeah, deeply meaningful and true, um, relating to that and finding times during your day and your week uh, in the moment to come back to that and then reorient yourself to these higher truths which sometimes can seem so hard to, to live up to. Um, so you can do it that way, straightening out your views by um, reading Dhamma, listening to Dhamma on a regular basis. But really it's an internal process. Um, and see if you could do that in the present moment. I mean, in, in one sense, uh, each time you come back to your meditation object or every time you um, come back to, to being the knowing, you're taking energy away from the mind that is a bit crooked, this word uju, so uh, straight. It means straight. It means straightness of mind or uprightness of mind, but also uprightness of body, body and mind. So, um, yeah, finding ways to bring uh, integrity or bring some kind of focus to your views uh, is really helpful. So I'll end that there, but maybe just go through those 10 uh, basis of ritual one more time for review. So the first is giving. Second is sila or principles. The third is bhavana or meditation. The fourth is apachayana or humility. Fifth is service or veya vacha. Six is patidana or sharing merit. Seventh is pat anumodana, rejoicing. The eighth is listening to dhamma, dhamma savana. The ninth is talking dhamma, dhamma desana. And then dit uju, dit uju gata, straightening out one's views. So, and those, if you didn't catch that down, if you weren't able to write all those, don't worry. Um, this will be up on YouTube in no time. And unfortunately, there aren't more talks on this. In the oldest level of the suttas, um, there were just three punya kiriyavatu, just three bases of merit, which were uh, generosity, virtue, and meditation. And then uh, later generations of um, practitioners added, kind of elaborated on that uh, to make the 10 
Um, but if it's useful, which I hope it is, then I um, hope people can practice it and um, just in the talk, formal talk there, and we can maybe go to questions. Um. Good. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just saying thank you for the thank you for the talk and, and um yeah, I I I um curious if, if you can um this is kind of a topic I've been trying to sort out a little bit in my mind. And um, I'm sure maybe you'll have some clarity on this. Um, but uh, yeah, the there's this, and, and I'm kind of paraphrasing here because I don't know exactly what it is, um, uh, what the wording is, but um, one of the qualities of um, to, uh, one of the qualities of a sotapanna is, um, I don't know if it's freedom from rites and rituals or overcoming rites and rituals, yeah. um, but I've, I've always been curious about how to navigate this field. Um, and um, is, it, is it having conscious awareness and, intent, and, and good intentionality when engaging in rites and rituals? Is that kind of the method of this rather than kind of rotely kind of doing this because you feel like you have to or something like that. Um, yeah, I'm curious about your thoughts about this. It's a, a great question. Could you say your name? I don't know. I can't see. Yeah, you. it's uh, Joey. Joey. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great question. So uh, stream enterer, this is the first stage of enlightenment. And with that first stage, one uh, basically is, is freed from, has basically transcended doubt, has transcended personality view, like thinking that this this is really me um, on a, thinking that the personality is me. And then rites and rituals, one completely transcends rites and rituals. And um, I'm just speaking personally for like a young, like hippie version of me, like coming across that like Buddhist practice, not only does it get me peaceful, but it also gets me to not have to deal with all of these like uh, rules and like uh, whatever else uh, religious people are into. I was like, all right, sign me up. That sounds great. Um, but I think actually, um, I think it's different, the experience for a stream uh, versus for us, say, practicing towards stream entry. For a stream enter, it's what's called pakata sila, which is just natural virtue. Like, it's not like a hard thing. You're not like, um, pushing away things which look like ritual saying, I'm never going to bow because that would be attachment to ritual. It's like, okay, I can bow if I want to, or if there's reason, I can not bow if, I, if there's not reason. Um, but I think the way that you framed it in terms of just a general practice as just bringing intentionality to it, knowing why we're doing something. Uh, the word, part of the word is the same. So um, sila bata paramasa is that attachment to rites and rituals. And that first word there is sila, um, which is the same as that second base of of merit the second uh, ritual is is virtue or precepts or principles um but you don't when you give this up at stream entry you don't paramasa it mus means to like to rub so you're not basically like fondling or you're not totally um absorbed in and um basically uh following something in a, a rote or unexamined way, but knowing why you're, you're doing the difference, um, keeping the principles that you're keeping and, um, engaging in the practices that you're engaging in, um, and, and being smart about that. And it's really hard. It's really hard. So, um, it's almost one that's, uh, impossible. Like one can regulate one's sila, one's principles. You take them formally, like we did before the meditation. Um, those are principles that I try to keep to, but when it comes to actual lived experience, our daily life, sila, um, when is the sila um, grasping and being too tight versus too loose? It's really something that you have to walk that um, you have to walk that that line um, yourself and, and and find the balance yourself. And unfortunately, I think in the 
experience of many practitioners, you do get more balance. You know, at first it feels like a tightrope. You just constantly are falling off one way or the other, just too loose. Okay, no principles. I'm just going to lie as much as I want or like drink or whatever, eat as much as I want. Um, you know, and fair enough, that's, um, but, and then you go to the opposite extreme. This is evil. Um, drugs are evil. Lying is evil. Liars are evil. You know, and you put people, so those are just things to watch out on either side of that, that tightrope. And hopefully when you practice more, it's not a tightrope any longer. It becomes a rather uh, broad path and you get more balance on it. So I hope that's helpful, Joey. Yeah, thank you. Hello, um, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, uh, my name is Trenton. Um, I had a question about um, the practice we did for the meditation, if that's okay. Um, I was kind of wondering, um, I feel like I have a, I have a very sticky mind where it's like my mind kind of latches onto something and it just zooms in like a, like a hyper-focus almost. And it's like, even if I wanted to kind of zoom out, um, there's just so much energy there that it feels kind of hard. And I was kind of wondering if you had any advice on, um, how to work with that to, to get some more spaciousness. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, that practice is certainly not for everyone. Um, there's a beautiful book, Satipatthana, The Direct Path to Realization, where Bhante Analyo basically just goes through uh, modern day and uh, meditation masters uh, and from the last basically 200 years from every Theravada Buddhist country and modern day teachers as well. And it basically shows that all these different teachers, they're not just doing one thing. Many teachers te teach breath meditation. Other teachers, Ajahn many others teach this being the knowing method. So it's just possible that that method's not for you. In terms of if you did want to experience experiment with that, um, I mean, the way you're describing your meditation, um, it sounds like a laser, a laser focus. And a laser focus can be great if you're um, able to have some spaciousness around it. But um, yeah, if, if it feels healthy and is going in a good direction, is leading to um, leading to ease both in the meditation and outside, then you don't really necessarily need to um, experiment with other things. But see if, taking that analogy of a laser, I mean, see if you can basically turn the laser around back to the the ruby or basically the, the inside of the laser itself. And um, yeah, where is, where is that laser light? Where is the focus coming from? And um, in the guided meditation, we talked about um, bringing the mind down to the, to the heart area. Um, and then from that heart area, as if that was a center, then experiencing uh, a kind of vastness or non-peripheral nature, a non-circumference, no having no surface, um, type spherical global awareness. Um, really, awareness doesn't have to have a center, but you can practice just staying rather than almost looking, rather than taking the verb of mental looking. See if you can take the... Um, the, the verb of just knowing or being with that spot. So the spot in the middle of the heart and see if you can just keep your awareness there. And then just whether it's small or big or vast or limitless or infinite, um, yeah, just let it be what it is. Just keep your object, okay, in, in the heart if you did want to experiment with that. And then you might find that um, you are able to keep the mind at this, <laughs> um, kind of almost deconstructed laser point in the heart, in the, so not in the head, not um, which can get too cerebral, but actually in the physical body, in the middle of the, middle of the chest, and then just staying with that point and see if it, if it grows and if, if that might lead to um, more, uh, a greater sense of, of well-being and ease. So I hope that helps. But if that doesn't work, then totally just stick with the breath or 
um, whatever object you're used to. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, my name is Mohan and um, my question is about uh, the object of meditation. So a few weeks back, uh, we received a mala uh, here. So uh, since that time, I've been practicing uh, instead of the breath as my object, I've been using the beads and then telling the uh, Buddham, Saranam, Gachami, the, the recitations. Uh, it's, uh, I, I couldn't even complete one full, <laughs> one full circle. Uh, so I, so I just wanted to want your guidance on this. Like, uh, like I'm switching between breath and the mala and it's, uh, it's, it's kind of confusing. <laughs> mm. So, uh, just your thoughts. Yeah, I, I do that as well. The Buddhang Saranangachami, Dhammang Saranangachami, Sanghang Saranangachami. I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha with malas um, every day. And I agree, yeah, it's it's not always easy to keep the mind with the mantra and um, yeah, the intention of the mantra and, and the whatever finger you're using to go through the mala. Um, but I think you could reconceptualize of the practice rather than I've got to get to the full, you know, do all 28 or 24 or 108 beads, um, you know, with mindfulness or with awareness at abs absolutely every single bead. I mean, that's a good um, conception on one level, but it can also lead to this like experience of failure. So actually just taking a, a more present moment goal is just, okay, even if I was gone, a present moment ritual, rather, even if I've been absent, you know, the mind's been with whatever um, for the last 30 beads, okay, this present moment, this is a moment of metta coming back to, uh, coming back to the mantra. And yeah, if, if going between the three is confusing, see if you can... Um, hold that space that I was talking about, which includes all of those, which can include the breath and the mantra and the, the hand motion. Um, that is, a, for many people, that can be a tall order, but you might find it um, that it, it allowing yourself that or experimenting with that might be, uh, might be useful. And if not, then, yeah, maybe seeing if you're doing a 108 bead mala, then it's broken up. You've got these spacer beads every um, 28 bead. I do this a lot. Basically, for this, for these 28 beads, I'm going to take my object to be the breath. For the next 28 beads, I'm going to take it to be basically the intention to give my heart to the Dhamma. The next 28 beads, I'll take it to the actual feeling of the finger touching the bead. Um, so being intentional, perhaps with fewer numbers of beads, um, limiting the, the scope. And then also just remembering... Um, to be kind to yourself every time you do come back. That's a that's an act of, of metta. It's a gesture of metta that you've done and no need to punish yourself to beat your over beat yourself over the back with your, your malas or with your mind. So I hope that helps. Um, what was your name again? Sorry. Mohan. Mohan, great. Very, very happy to hear you using the mala. Think, Thank you. I think we might just have one time for one more question. Um, we've got one here from Peter on uh, on Zoom. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Ajahn, for the talk. Uh, I really uh, enjoyed your. Um, I really enjoyed the uh, meditation uh, mm -hmm. today. Um, you said at the beginning that that was. Um, based on the third foundation. And I always understood that the third foundation in the Satipatthana Sutta was um, kind of mindfulness of mind in terms of emotions or thoughts in the mind and how you hold those and kind of observe them coming and going. Uh, but this seemed like a different emphasis so could you explain that a little bit, please? 
Uh, yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, yeah, that when that uh, third foundation of mindfulness is described in the Satipatthana Sutta, um, it's it is described as you say, one knows uh, the mind with greed as a mind with greed. One knows the mind with anger as a mind with anger. One knows the mind without anger, without greed, as a mind without anger, without greed. One knows the expansive mind as an expansive mind, the unexpanded mind as an unexpanded mind. And what that meditation is doing um, is establishing that place. So um, the Pali is chitte chitanu pasi viharati. One dwells, um, oftentimes is translated as contemplating, but it, it could also be one dwells seeing or one dwells knowing the mind in the mind or the mind around the mind. Uh, it's For Pali nerds, uh, it's a locative case. So you can use the location of the mind is is very much a part of um, what you're paying attention to. Um, and just establishing this broader space within which um, thoughts or anger or greed or expansiveness can occur. So it's almost as if you're sitting on a a mountaintop and then the clouds of greed or the clouds of uh, selfishness or envy come up and that's that's how you know them that's knowing these aspects of mind within the mind or even as a part of the mind um, so you can experiment with what that means to um, be in the mind be of the mind um, around the mind within the mind um, so you're almost just learning how to inhabit this um, vessel of of spacious awareness. Is that hopefully mm -hmm. that gives some context? Good. Yeah, yeah, thank you. 